Hello and welcome to AI, the future of us, a podcast style video series that explores the ways in which AI is shaping our future and how we can prepare for the changes that lie ahead as developers, as people in cloud, cloud architects. I'm your host, Priyanka Vergaria, and today we are joined by Janakiram MSV, who is um, an analyst in this cloud industry and space for quite some time. Thank you so much for being here, Jan. Thanks, Priyanka. It's my pleasure. Amazing. So let's kick this conversation off with a little bit of background and, and your expertise in, in cloud and in AI. Sure. So I spent uh, a lot of time at Microsoft, about a decade, followed by a couple of years at AWS. And for the last decade or so, I have been a one-man shop, primarily focused on market research analysis and the evolution of cloud. And and how is AI part of this? What have you been um, doing so far in AI and learning about based on this research? Um, and where do you see this going? Right. So when AI was just picking up the momentum uh, a few years ago, I think in 2014, 2015, I realized cloud is going to be the powerhouse uh, that will generate the electricity. Uh, sorry, Andrew Ng, but if you call AI as electricity, I call cloud as the powerhouse. So I realized that is going to be the logical home uh, where a lot of AI models are going to be generated and trained. So I started focusing on that. Uh, so I started my journey by understanding what is machine learning and how it is different from traditional software development. So initially I used tools like sklearn, which is scikit-learn and used managed cloud services like you know Google Cloud ML Engine, Azure ML and very early versions of SageMaker. I learned the basics and the fundamentals of ML uh, by just you know looking at how this is becoming a managed service offered by the hyperscalers. So it started from there and today it has come to a point where a lot of complex AI based services are offered as APIs. You know, you don't need to know a lot of AI uh, thanks to the evolution of foundation models and generative AI. Uh, it is just becoming just an API co to consume, but uh, this API will empower and enable so many developers and organizations to infuse the power of AI into their applications. Yeah, so it's like you you talked about electricity and the and the powerhouse and and powering that and and that's kind of where if the the cl basically cloud lies, right? Where a uh, cloud is going to be this uh, this powerhouse of igniting all of these AI APIs, so that not everybody has to be an expert in AI and ML, but everybody can utilize AI and ML. So sort of like democratizing the the power of AI and ML. Um, uh, with that, uh, what do you see as like effective uses of AI um, in the cloud industry or just in tech industry in general? Right. So AI is going to impact and influence almost every vertical. Uh, from entry level jobs, you know, like data entry or converting Excel to PDF uh, or, or uh, you know, just digitizing from there all the way to very sophisticated, very advanced SRE jobs. AI is going to influence almost every vertical and every individual uh, in this industry. Now, since I focus on more of operations and specifically cloud operations and DevOps, I'm seeing some interesting things that are going to come up. Number one, the whole application of LLMs and GPT-like models for operations is going to be revolutionary. Uh, you know, just like large uh, language models are trained on textual data and they're able to auto-complete and generate content, imagine training these LLMs with logs uh, that are generated by open source software containers and, and these logs are going to be pretty standard, you know, whether you run it in Minikube or in a multi-node cluster in GKE, the logs are going to be the same, the, the error messages are going to be the same. So imagine training LLMs based on the observability data coming from infrastructure workloads and uh, the supporting open source software and then uh, creating uh, an automation, an agent-driven automation that can not only suggest what needs to be done, but can even remediate. Uh, so that takes over your 
escalation, you know, basically the support escalation of L1, L2, L3 and LLMs will play a, a very powerful role in uh, analyzing the logs that come out, segregating them, uh, you know, which is basically classification and then trying to remediate. And only if they fail to remediate, it gets escalated to uh, an SRE, you know, who is responsible for the uptime. So this is going to impact the way we do DevOps today, uh, all the way from writing code to deploying it in production and even day to operations. So this is going to be huge and, and significant. It is going to impact the DevOps uh, uh, vertical and the overall cloud operations vertical significantly. That is such a great example. It's also like end-to-end -end use of um, of AI in, in the entire life cycle. Um, what are some of the, because I, this also points to the skills that, that we would need to, as individuals in this DevOps ecosystem, would need to either possess or uh, grow into. So what are, the, what are some of the key skills that um, that individuals should possess to be successful in this AI-driven world, uh, maybe with that example or any other example. Right. You know, just like anything else, we are going to see two personas in this ecosystem. You know, one persona is responsible for fine-tuning these language models for infrastructure. Uh, they are very few. Uh, you know, they understand how parameters work, what is fine tuning and how do we apply custom data sets? So that is going to be one persona. And that's a very, very uh, unique skill and uh, uh, a special skill to have. You know, if you come from basic understanding of fine tuning models and if you know what is hyperparameter tuning, transfer learning, and also infrastructure, that is the sweet spot for you. You are in a very unique place to exploit, you know, this whole new revolution. So that is basically the one side of persona where you are training the models and fine tuning models. But majority of us are going to be on the other side where we consume this. So if you understand observability, I think uh, you need to understand what is prompt engineering and how do you feed these observability data like logs and events to LLMs uh, and how do you connect the dots so that it not only you know responds with auto completion and some uh, remediation techniques, but how do you connect the dots and what tools do you need uh, to close the loop? Uh, for example, you know, when uh, your large language model detects that uh, uh, the CPU utilization is, is at its brim and uh, it needs to add another node, for example. Now, as an infrastructure engineer, it's your job to connect the dots and make sure that, you know, you're able to add one more node to the cluster or enable horizontal power auto scaling. Uh, so so that's that's where, you know, there is a lot of opportunity uh, converting the responses given by generative AI into more of actionable tasks and going for advanced automation, taking Terraform, Ansible, uh, and all your scripts to the next level by connecting the dots. So that is a very unique skill. So to summarize, you know, there are two things. One is fine tuning these generative AI models for infrastructure and observability data and consuming those LLMs and uh, connecting them back to your automation pipelines and scripting engines so that you are basically getting into an autopilot mode. Yeah, and then in and maybe that that second persona is also responsible for like taking uh, the the data set that is important to sort of, sort of train this model because the teams that will train the models are ML experts. They are not the observability experts, right? So it falls on you because the model is only going to do as good as the data that you provided. So um, that that piece would also somehow fall into the the expertise of, of the observability teams um, in this particular example. So it, this is to also represent that uh, any use cases we, we see evolve would require on top of those foundational models would require um, the expert experts in each of these fields that we end up creating the models for to, to help make the models better over time with uh, the, t the type of data that, that we need, the rich data sets that we need, and then obviously the expertise to sort of use those models and consume them in the right way. Um, so thank you Absolutely. for that. Yeah. So looking ahead of what do you believe is the is the most exciting potential application of AI um, that we have uh, that we are yet to see? I, I know you mentioned this DevOps use case, but um, 
anything more further, like a stretch, like five, ten years from now? Oh, that's too difficult to uh, visualize because things are moving so fast. We can't even predict what's what's coming up in a quarter from now. Uh, but but in the near future, what I actually visualize is. Uh, you know, aggregating uh, multiple LLMs and generative AI models to solve more complex and advanced tasks. Uh, this is not specific to the AI ops or the DevOps automation that uh, I mentioned earlier, but, you know, with uh, generative AI focusing on pretty much every type of content, you know, like textual content, imagery content, and video content, uh, imagine the power of multimodal uh, uh, generative AI, where you are able to feed the output of one generative AI model to, to another and ultimately get what you want. You know, for example, uh, if you look at e-commerce product managers, when they want to generate synthetic images that are representing their product and they need to write, uh, you know, some kind of a blurb or an abstract explaining their product uh, and also do some quick competitive analysis uh, and, and generate a 3D video. Now, today, they have to use a variety of tools and takes literally weeks or sometimes months to come out uh, uh, with this output that can go live on their website. But with generative AI, uh, the product manager responsible for this queue will be able to use one agent that will orchestrate uh, all these uh, models, generative AI models responsible for textual content, imagery and visual video content and will come out with a package, you know, that he can straight away embed in his website. And that is going to be significantly accelerating and uh, making a huge difference to, you know, product managers who are responsible for positioning their products. Yeah. And um, we just launched this gen um, app builder, which is um, sort of in that realm of like you being able to create your own model really quickly in the voice of let's say your PR in your uh, your legal terms and then create this model and then start to use it in campaigns for social media. So sort of that end-to-end -end story and, and it's possible to do that super quickly. I'm also thinking about another use case, like let's say wanting to make cloud easier to use, um, you're asking in chat, like how do I build a website? Just a super simple example. And then obviously it's a very open-ended question there's like multiple things that that the uh, AI, like multi-turn AI conversation you're having. Okay, what kind of website do you want? What's the type of traffic? Amount of um, amount of number of users? Where are they going to be? Is it global? Right. All of those parameters um, then lead to okay. Here's the type of architecture that could work for your website, and then you end up saying no, no, no. I've got a very small team, and then you're like, okay, yeah, you, you got to go serverless. So, like things like that would would um, seem like that whole multimodal um, aspect of it. Of like, here's a picture, then here's a documentation, and that's kind of where I see the future to be even more exciting. Um, and I think we are not too far from that, which uh, which is very which is very very um, empowering. So, any last Absolutely. words? Anything else you want to add about the future of AI? What are you excited about? Anything else? Yeah. So you know, just like cloud has evolved, and today we have large hyperscalers with their own APIs and their own protocols. Uh, what I'm very excited about is how these investments coming from the hyperscalers would change the world, particularly. Uh, you know, the, the, the DevOps and the cloud operations uh, model. I am visualizing a world where we are going to see agents uh, that are going to be orchestrating the prompt engineering uh, and uh, fine tuning and all of that, which will become the front end. You know, just like uh, you have Kubernetes as an orchestrator, orchestrating a set of containers, LLMs are going to be huge and uh, we are going to see agents that are going to be specialized for individual verticals that will uh, act as a front end and will negotiate with the back end LLMs and Gen AI models uh, to do what is appropriate and what is specific to the end user. So we'll see uh, this this evolution of agents taking over and become the orchestrators of multimodal deployments. Yeah, and then in in between all of that, like so LLMs would make the natural language part of it more easy, but then also the back end part of it more easy. And on and including all this, we would need this middle layer of like the APIs or the middleware that will actually make things happen. So if I said, stop this virtual machine when 
things like this happen, um, then the ability to stop the virtual machine is through like this middleware, uh, but the LLM is behind it and in front of it to sort of understand the lang natural language and then also understand the uh, the operations piece of it. Um, it's going it's going to be very exciting. Thank you so much for joining us today, Johnny. Um, it has been incredibly insightful to hear your thoughts on the impact and the effective use of AI. Um, we really look forward to seeing how AI will continue and uh, shape our world in clouds and just in general. Um, so stay tuned. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation.